Ann Mullen with Cycle Technologies. Our topic for this presentation is healthy sleep and the menstrual cycle. I'm very pleased to welcome my guest today, fertility expert, Dr. Mary Lee Barron. Hello, Dr. Barron. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad to be there. Uh, Dr. Barron is an associate professor of nursing at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and was formerly at St. Louis University School of Nursing in St. Louis, Missouri. She's also a Marquette model teacher and has published many articles on natural family planning and fertility health knowledge. And one of her articles is on our topic of today, which is sleep and the menstrual cycle which is a most interesting topic and not one that you often hear about when discussing reproductive health. So, Dr. Barron, I'm just curious if you could quickly let us know how you came upon this topic and what led you to explore it further. Well, um, years ago, about 1998 or 1999, I had been talking with um, an NFP teacher who did a presentation on um, the effect of light on the menstrual cycle and she had not been able to publish her findings. So later when I became a doctoral student, I decided I was going to pursue that topic um, mm -hmm. because there hadn't been anything and I did not disbelieve her. So um, I went ahead and looked into it and um, found that chronobiology, which is the biology of the circadian rhythm or our biological clock, was um, just becoming a lot more active and it's really a hot topic um, in research today. Well, I found your article fascinating and also other information that uh, you let me take a look at. And there was so much information, I've tried to narrow it down in this presentation to just focus on sleep and the menstrual cycle and how it affects women. But um, we'll touch a little bit on just how uh, wide uh, of an influence sleep and melatonin has. So we'll be discussing uh, how sleep, melatonin, and light exposure impact a woman's reproductive ph physiology, especially, as I mentioned, her menstrual cycle. And then at the very end, Dr. Barron, I know you have some very good tips uh, on habits and routines to help people get uh, a good sleep. So I wanted to review real quickly what is sleep, since that's what we're talking about. And I have a few points that uh, you made in your article. And the first one I found very interesting, which is sleep is really not well understood. Well, that is because um, we tend not to think about it. <laughs> um, and so to study it is kind of interesting. And so that um, we've really begun to understand how it how we behave during sleep and um, the process processes that go um, to support our sleeping. Well, and you say that sleep is active, and you know most people don't really think of it that way. Uh, they think you know maybe the lights are out and I'm quiet for a long time and then I wake up. But yeah, I think uh, our perception is that the brain goes to sleep when actually the brain does nothing of the sort. Um, Sleep is a behavior, and it's organized into five stages. Four of them are non-REM sleep, and then one is REM sleep. And REM means rapid eye movement. And um, it's associated with increased contraction of the eye muscles. Mm -hmm. So um, it's called rapid eye movement sleep. And it accounts for about 25% of our sleep and occurs actually every 90 minutes during the night. And they know that the brain activity is highest during REM sleep. So it's pretty important. Well, it looks like there's a lot of things going on with sleep. Um, it's complex and you say highly regulated. It's essential to life and everyone sleeps. So getting to your point about how sleep is regulated, uh, you had written about well, how there's these two body systems. Right, and um, the regulation of sleep is through the hormonal pathways, and they're very active, and that is what triggers these phases of sleep and how sleep is um, integrated with um, our other functions of our body. Well, I have here bolded, so under the circadian biological clock, you talked about being hormonal. There's several hormones that come into play, but melatonin seems to have quite a unique and interesting role. So we're going to talk mostly about that in this presentation. Uh, first of all, what is melatonin? And you describe it as a hormone. Yes, 
it is a hormone, and it is the hormone that does trigger sleep. So um, light suppresses melatonin, which you would um, figure because you wouldn't need it so much during the daytime. Um, but you do need it to sleep at night, and so therefore the hormone of darkness really does describe it very well. But more importantly than that, I think, is to understand that, um, well, not more importantly, but also we have to understand that it's a powerful scavenger of free radicals. That means it's your anti-cancer hormone, mm -hmm. and so it's um, very, it has very important functions that way as well. And it that. reduces inflammation or what is known as oxidative stress. Well, it sounds like it's very important to you. You hear a lot about antioxidants these days and people putting them in foods and drinks and so on. Uh, now, very fascinating. You talk about how melatonin affects a woman's fertility directly. Now, you, there are a number of technical terms that you use, and these are the five points. Um, I was wondering if you could go through them a little bit and explain exactly what you're talking about, the stimulatory effect and, and so on. Well, um, the melatonin affects the gonadotropins, that would be follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are commonly known as FSH and LH and mm -hmm. obviously are very involved in the menstrual cycle. But it also has very direct action on the ovarian cells. There are receptor sites in the ovary for melatonin. And I was really amazed when I found out that it was present in the follicular fluid. That's the fluid that bathes the egg. And um, so it's um, right there, uh, very important to ovulation. Yeah, I was and surprised then, about that point when I, when I read that, that it's not just a, a trigger somehow in the brain, but it's actually present right there in the ovary. Yeah, present right there. And then the luteal phase, um, it, you see less of its influence on the gonadotropins and, th and thyroid-stimulating hormone. Um, and then you, it rises and you see it, that it stimulates progesterone. Now, progesterone should be understood as the pro-pregnancy hormone mm -hmm. because it not only readies the endometrium or the uterine lining, but it supports pregnancy. And so um, that's an easy way to remember that is the pro-pregnancy hormone. That's an interesting uh, one to know. Uh, but going on or back to the menstrual cycle, you listed a number of points that are parameters of a normal menstrual cycle. And uh, before we go on and talk about how melatonin affects it, maybe you could talk a bit about what is actually a normal menstrual cycle. Okay, so we typically consider the menstrual cycle to be 21. You'll see some definitions 35 days, others 38 days um, in length normally. And um, women vary in that 21 to 38 day cycle length. Um, and they, 30 percent or more of women vary, uh, vary up to seven days, meaning that um, one month they might be 26 days, the next month they might be 33 days, the next month they might be 28 days, and that's entirely normal. Women are not thinking these days about um, the fact that the menstrual cycle does vary. We are irregularly irregular. <laughs> and so then, um, then there is a six-day approximately mucus cycle that's associated with, and the rise of mucus is due to estrogen, and so that would be considered your fertile window. And then after you ovulate, so the post-ovulatory, peak being a term for ovulation, that luteal phase is in a range of women is 9 to 17 days, but in, in a woman it doesn't vary by a day or two. So every month you'll have a woman whose post-peak phase is 9 to 10 days. Mm -hmm. Another woman might be 13 or 14, another would be 16 or 17. But So the individual woman just a day or two, among women 9 to 17 days. And then the bleeding pattern usually is heavy, moderate to light, or moderate to light, which is decrescendo, or maybe she'll spot the first day and then after that she'll be heavy to moderate to light or she'll be moderate to light. And I think by decrescendo you mean that it, it tapers off, is that right? Correct. That's exactly it. And then you talk about how the uh, melatonin has an effect during this phase. So I, on the right I have this wheel of 
the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase, ovulation, um, you know, peak days, and then luteal phase. And you're saying that the effects of melatonin vary then during that time. They do. And so um, if, so the idea is that melatonin stimulates progesterone. You would um, see then variations on melatonin with the peak in the luteal phase because that is when your progesterone is highest. Well, then that, that would make sense. Now, this next slide, you were so kind to send me this, it is melatonin and the reproductive cycle. Now, it's very complicated, um, but uh, the way I interpret it is it looks like light plays an important role in the whole cycle, striking the eye and, you know, communicating with the brain and communicating with the ovary. Could you walk us through what, this, um, what we're looking at here? Yes, um, what that's meant to represent is that you um, absorb light through your eyes. Um, light has to strike the retina in order to trigger the stimulation or suppression of melatonin because uh, melatonin is suppressed by light. Mm -hmm. And then there's a structure in the brain, the SCN is the suprachiasmic nucleus, oh, which is in very hypothalamus. long words. <laughs> yeah, hard to say. But in any case, what happens is, is that um, that stimulates the gonadotropin releasing hormone in the intuitary pituitary, which then um, we release FSH and LH as a result of that. The um, melatonin is um, then it, it's sequestered in the follicular fluid in the ovary, and then it enhances progesterone number six is it enhances progesterone production from the cells in the ovary and then the cells in the corpus luteum. So, so yeah, I mean, so it looks like the point is that it is a, a complex interaction, but mm -hmm. it looks like each step is vital. That's right. It is. So now, one of the things on the chart or on the diagram was this, the light it seemed to be a very important uh, component of what's going on. And so in your article, you talked about how light and light changes can affect uh, the menstrual cycle. And here are some special circumstances. Could you talk about how um, the, the difference in melatonin secretion can affect people? Yes, I would be happy to. So um, obviously, shift work is going to have a profound effect on one's exposure to the light mm -hmm. and there have been a number of studies um, that and they're still going on we're still studying shift workers on this and to try to give them the best prescription for minimizing the disruptions of shift work um, but basically remember that melatonin is an anti um, accident hormone and so interestingly enough shift workers have a higher, nurses were in particular were studied, have a higher incidence of breast cancer. Hmm. And um, the other thing is the length of the menstrual cycle is somewhat dose dependent, meaning that the disruption is higher for the longer that you do shift work. And so um, we also see this with seasonal changes. And um, think of the person who lives in um, Alaska. Mm -hmm. where you might have a 23-hour day or a 23-hour night, and when they are in those extremes is when ovulation and therefore menstrual cycles are disrupted. And in fact, there was a study in Finland where um, they looked at this, and I read, and I wish I could tell you the resource, it's been a little while since I read this, but mm -hmm. women from the Scandinavian area is being sent south for a little while to get their menses uh, regulated, so oh, they could a, a nice vacation to <laughs> like yes, yeah, so a vacation to get pregnant. <laughs> so um, it's a reflection of their amount of light exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, something interesting you said was so not just the fertility can be affected, but it sounds like someone's risk for cancer uh, can also be affected, which is uh, not something right. that you think about when being associated right. with. Uh, sleep changes. Um, and then the light exposure, uh, you talk about how it has a very uh, distinct uh, effect. And it perhaps does. you could talk a little bit about here the menstrual changes. And so when I first read about this, um, it, I had found a study that was done actually in 1968. It was reported on. And 
they had set a table lamp um, in the woman's bedroom. And it, the table lamp is about 250 lux, L-U-X. Um, and they found that it shortened the menstrual cycle. And they were thinking that they could develop this as a birth control method. Oh, obviously, uh -huh. didn't go there with that. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, that and then further studies, even low levels of light at night have an effect on your melatonin. And so, well, yeah, I mean, a table lamp is, is not that bright right. compared to but sunlight. But even lower levels of light than that can um, have some effect on the um, cycle. Mm -hmm. What about nightlights? So, some people have nightlights in there. Yeah, and nightlights are completely unnecessary. If you think about the person who lived before the year of 1870 or so, but I don't know what year electric light came out. I think that was Edison probably mm -hmm. in the 90s, 1890s. But um, the person who lived before we had light at night, they didn't have light at night and they managed to survive <laughs> or we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So um, we in an industrial society think that light is completely harmless, but in fact it's not. And so um, for example, we are uh, spectrally sensitive to light. We're more sensitive to the blues and greens, um, and they're very actively studying blue light. Um, for an alarm clock, you should have the red light because red light is has pretty much a placebo effect. Um, that is the placebo that they use in all of these light studies. And so um, the psychiatrists were the, really, the first clinicians who really picked up on what biologists had been looking at. And, um, and it was the association with depressive disorders um, that they looked into. They looked into PMS mm -hmm. um, because those are disorders of the luteal phase. And so if you think that a person's disrupted, it would make sense that their melatonin wouldn't be at the same level that somebody without PMS would have. So they looked into their sleep very carefully, and they had um, physiologic differences. Um, they found that they had lower, shorter, and advanced nocturnal secretion of in PMS, mm -hmm. so they they tried bright light therapy on them, and it was effective for their depressive symptoms. Maybe not other ones, but um, um, and that PMS women had a higher frequency of luteinizing hormone. So basically, things are off it, with that disorder in terms of their melatonin. And, well, and here uh, you have at the bottom also an early decline of ovarian function when women right. are depressed. Depressed women are more likely to become perimenopausal and menopausal sooner than women who do not suffer from depression. Is that something that's been known a while, or is that something um, Again, new? this is um, something that's come out of the studies um, primarily between 1997 and 2003, I think, is when we kind of so picked up on that. Fairly particular. Mm -hmm. So we're hurting ourselves with light and don't know it. So sounds like, well, I did want, I mean, you spoke about PMS. I did want to ask how uh, PMS fit into the picture. And, and I believe you did cover these points um, already, which was about the lower and shorter uh, advanced nocturnal melatonin and so on. Uh, was there anything else about, I know that PMS affects a lot of people and it might be interesting. Is there anything else that um, you would like to let people know about in this regard? Well, I don't have a, a magic bullet on that one, um, <laughs> unfortunately, but it is a physiologic um, uh, or pathophysiologic functioning that we are seeing in that. And I think the more that we look into um, sleep studies and light therapy studies, we'll know more about how best to help these women. Mm -hmm. But in that, there's a psychiatric group of physicians who are actively working on that research in California. Oh, well, that's good to know. So we'll look forward to uh, see what comes out of that. Now, uh, the other fascinating thing that I that you mentioned that um, I found interesting was how melatonin is present in the ovary. So um, you answer the question: Does melatonin affect egg, qual egg quality or quality of the ovum? And you said yes. And could you explain a little bit further about uh, how that how that works, the egg quality aspect? Um, 
This really comes from the folks who do in vitro fertilization, um, where they've put patients on three milligrams of melatonin given at 10 p.m. to enhance the luteal phases. And what they found was that it improved the embryo quality. And they thought that that was due to the anti-inflammatory effects of melatonin. But interestingly enough, um, when sperm are exposed to enhanced melatonin in labs, it improves sperm motility and mobility as well. And they think the mechanism is that it's minimizing the DNA damage because it's an anti-inflammatory as well. And so um, that uh, the, 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 I think we have more similarities with our reaction to melatonin than we do dissimilarities. <laughs> Even though we're men and women, I think we have a lot of similarities there. Hello? Yes, that is an interesting um, thing that it affects both men and women. And we're focusing here mostly on uh, the women and menstrual right. cycle, but that it affects men is interesting as well and maybe something for people to think about if perhaps they're having trouble with their fertility. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, because you mentioned it early on and it was on your paper, was can melatonin be used as a treatment? The problem with melatonin um, is that it's not regulated by the FDA. It's treated as a dietary supplement. And so what um, is available to people, it doesn't come with a recommendation on a dose. And I haven't seen evidence to, to let me know what I should be recommending, like 3 milligrams or 10 milligrams. Um, there's simply not a lot of evidence out there for that right now, and um, but if people would choose to use melatonin, and they do for various reasons, they should always get the product that's marked USP, which is United States Pharmacopeia, mm -hmm. which basically guarantees that what is in that bottle is what it says is in that bottle. So you say that it's a supplement and it's not necessarily harmful, but uh, maybe not think about self-therapy uh, or self-treatment, right. is that right? We don't have real guidelines for its use. Well, and then it has a very short half-life, 25 minutes or so, so oh. it's not going to last that long. Mm -hmm. um, so a person who is actively needing this or going to use it would actually need an extended release formulation. Also, it continues to stay in the body. Right. And so I don't know, you know, I haven't gone to the supermarket or, or pharmacy shelves to even look um, because my first thing with people is to recommend that they uh, get their sleeping habits up to snuff first. All right, which seems like, you know, the, the topic of this whole discussion is that uh, sleep affects the menstrual cycle, so um, it would be uh, important to get your sleep and maybe not think about uh, supplements. Uh, so that is mostly what we are the interaction with melatonin and the menstrual cycle. And going on to sleep, I was interested in all the things you had to say about getting enough sleep. And, but one of the first things I was interested in is what exactly is sleep deprivation? So people might be tired, but how do you know if you actually have a, a condition? Well, if you are sleep deprived, you are going to fall asleep pretty readily um, after a short period of time, um, lying down and then being asleep within five minutes or so, um, and feeling drowsy during the day. So the important thing is that to not underestimate that sleep deprivation is very dangerous because um, if you are sleep deprived, you are as impaired in driving, for example, as those who are intoxicated. Oh, it does sound very so, dangerous. And you can have memory problems, depression, a weakening of your immune system. Um, which only increases your chance of becoming sick. And also, people have a higher perception of pain when they're sleep deprived. Oh, that is an interesting one. I hadn't heard that one. Um, as far as, you know, feeling very tired, that, I guess that sounds like an obvious one. But what about, you know, the normal highs and lows of a day? Like a lot of people, you know, mid-afternoon, you know, have a, a bit of a groggy time. Is that... Well, if you're the person who can... Um, do a 10-minute power nap and do mm -hmm. it successfully, you should do that. <laughs> okay. But um, it's, not, it, it's not recommended that you lay down for an hour or more um, during the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's counterintuitive to do that. 
Well, then I wanted to go on to the many uh, great recommendations you have for healthy sleep. And I've got a, a couple slides here where you uh, point out, uh, for example, to maintain a regular bedtime and regular waking times. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, moderation is the key here. I'm not saying to never go out in the evening, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. the more you can maintain your regular bedtimes and waking times, um, the better you're going to do. We should be creatures of habit in terms of our sleep. Um, but you don't want to go to bed until you are sleepy. Uh, which seems kind of obvious, but I guess there's not such a thing as ke or getting ahead of your sleep, perhaps. That's right. You can't save up on sleep. Um, and then you say sleep long eno enough to avoid feeling tired, but it sounds like don't sleep in for too long. Is that right? Yeah, I think we all did that when we were teenagers, didn't we? <laughs> we talked about <laughs> as late as we could. Try to do that. But as adults, that's not really a very healthy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then um, you do, you do want to unwind at night. Um, and I think we have another slide on some specific things that you want to do. In yes, I'll, we'll mind. take a look at those just next here. Um, and I did think it was interesting you were saying designate your bedroom for sleep and for sex, but don't uh, spend too much time in your bedroom otherwise. Right. You don't want to have a television in your room. That's not a good idea. Uh -huh. You're better off just to save your room for sleeping and for sex. Uh, now, the other thing that you talk about is medical problems. Um, maybe people don't think about this so much. So what I'm wondering is, is it a medical problem that, well, besides the obvious of waking you up, but does it disrupt the phases of sleep too? Like maybe you don't know you're being disrupted, but maybe you're Right, paying. exactly. And so you do the things to avoid um, those things which do disrupt your sleep. Like if you're a woman and you have an overactive bladder, well then, you need to see somebody about that, or you need to take on habits that diminish that effect. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, caffeine is a bladder irritant. Naturally, you wouldn't want to use that near bedtime anyway, since it's, it's stimulant. But um, reducing your fluid um, by 8 p.m. or so, you want to deal with your overactive bladder. For hot flashes, um, the uh, layered look is best, and <laughs> having a ceiling fan. Um, to keep the air moving is helpful to a lot of women. If you peel off your layers help. as you need them. Yes, peeling off the layers and dealing with pain. Pain does interrupt sleep. You need to be careful about which medications you take for that because there are certain drugs um, that ruin sleep architecture, as they call it, and <laughs> one of those is the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. Oh, okay, so, so like aspirin, ibuprofen, or uh, what's the other one, naproxen, sodium? Yeah, take Tylenol oh, instead of ibuprofen. Oh, for have less time. of an effect. Okay, that's interesting. Um, now, you did give some good tips if you have difficulty sleeping. So if someone is uh, maybe having a hard time going to sleep or also waking, um, don't watch the clock. So <laughs> what do you recommend? Um, well, Resist that to look at the clock, you know, because mm -hmm. um, it's usually not helpful. But if you are, um, find yourself looking at the clock and you're awake for more than 25 or 30 minutes, then get up and go and read or meditate or pray. Um, don't watch television in the middle of the night because you're stimulating the suppression of melatonin, which only mm -hmm. makes it worse. Um, you want to be in a dimly lit room, but um, not one that is so bright that you're you're going to really suppress it. So enough to read, but not to watch television, which is actually very much brighter. Well, and you had mentioned this before to avoid naps. So I guess that makes sense if you're, you know, sleeping during right. the day, you may not be that tired at night. And then exercise regularly, but uh, maybe not at night. Right. Not too close to bedtime. You know, exercising mm -hmm. at 7 p.m., but not at 10. Mm -hmm. If you go to bed like at 10.30. Um, exercise really does help a great deal with because you're you're using a lot of energy to do that so and then sleeping in a cool dark and quiet bedroom is really important and um, a quick and dirty way to know how to darken your bedroom is that it should be dark enough for you not to see a picture on the wall and so mm -hmm. that requires room darkening shades and, and um, curtains because we forget about street lights that shine into our room oh, right, yeah and um, and then, of course, you don't need a nightlight. 
Um, and then the last one you talk about is comfortable bedding. So, you know, we spend a third of our life in bed. So I think it's a worthwhile investment to get a good mattress. And I think that um, it's interesting because when I was much younger, the mattress stores would say, oh, it's going to last for 20 years. Well, now it's eight. <laughs> Oh so and they're a lot more expensive than they were when they said they were 20. Back then, I was like, 12 years of bad sleep. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you're, if you consider that spending money on a mattress is probably an investment well made. And now you had a final list of good habits for healthy sleep. And uh, I like this one. Um, I think it talks about discipline. Say yes to sleep when you're tempted to stay up late. Mm -hmm. Maybe watching your detective your show or time. something. Yes, if you're regular bedtime, and we can tape or do the DVR for almost everything. So if it's something on television, just tape it and go in back and watch it later because it, there's no point. Um, you know, if you, if you, especially if you have some difficulties, but that's a good habit to be in. And then um, I think the next one. Uh, yeah, you said don't do work email after dinner. Mm -hmm. or after and that's because you don't want to be engaging your brain all over again. If you think that um, you're going to be dealing with emails that are going to launch a whole sequence of thoughts and that you may not be able to rest your mind before you go to bed, it's not worth it. <laughs> and, um, you know, most things can be dealt with just as easily the next morning. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, it's about getting that stress response eliminated. Well, uh, you on this third point, it sounds like these two can go hand in hand. So, you know, dealing with worries mm -hmm. uh, later or sleeping on it, as you say. And then I told you that I have a colleague that um, she keeps a note paper by her bedside. Mm -hmm. And so she wakes up worrying about something. She simply writes it on the notepad and... And then I have another one who said, I call myself at work and leave myself a message on my phone. So she has her phone by her bed. That's a good one. And uh, so she, she does. Then she can go back to sleep knowing she's not going to forget what it is she thought of. And so people do have ways of, um, of doing that, which is, in, in essence, what they're doing is they're decreasing their worries and that interference with their sleep. Uh, you also say get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that um, we need less sleep as we age and we need a little bit less sleep, but um, the thing is, is when you get to a certain age, you do not sleep as well. And so um, you become increasingly resistant to your own melatonin. And so um, it is important to have those good habits for good sleep. So you're saying that melatonin is, continues to be secreted, but your body pays less attention to it? That's right. That's right. And so um, um, another hormone that we sometimes become resistant to when we are pre-diabetic or diabetic is insulin. We produce it, hmm. but we don't respond as well to it. So you could think of it like that. But there's a natural physiologic function going on here. So you have to make more effort. Uh, now, uh, the last er, one that you have here is don't stay in bed. So I guess if you wake up... You can't go back and, to sleep. Right. Don't hang out. That's when you can listen to music or read, but, you know, keep that bright television light off. Now, you had mentioned before, and I, I was wondering about this, um, you're saying television is bad, and you talked about blue light. Mm -hmm. um, is that... So are those blue light things? is an active area of study. Um, they're looking at it in terms of um, the effect it has on us. I've read preliminary work that they're concerned about its correlation to macular degeneration. Oh. Um, and I'm, So I'm not going to tell you anything conclusive about blue light except to say that we are spectrally sensitive and that the early light studies um, with, found very early that blue or green light had a different effect than red light did. So I suppose so, um, for people who look a lot at their computer or um, mm -hmm. smartphone and so on, is that the same effect? So they're looking at Instagram or Facebook late at yeah. night before they go to bed. That's, that's the thing that um, they're looking into in terms of blue light, mm. that it's actively being researched. So I don't have anything conclusive to say about it, except that you have to think about, um, you know, what what is turning your brain on at night and what is what is stimul or suppressing your melatonin. You know, those are the things you want to deal with.
Okay, well, we'll look forward to what the studies say in the future. Now, you did touch on eating and drinking before sleep, so I was surprised to read that you advocated for a snack before bed. Right. If you're having difficulty sleeping, then a light snack, it has to be a certain type of snack because, um, for example, the tryptophan-rich foods, uh, tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, and serotonin is that um, hormone that helps you uh, chill out to kind of smooth, makes you calm, and what have you. And so um, there are other foods that are pretty rich that way, which are listed there. And, oh, yeah, I was surprised. Um, Nuts and seeds and bananas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. also look fairly easily digestible, mm -hmm. are those, and the, the light carbohydrates. Um, and then right. you talk about things that you should not eat before you go to bed. It seems <laughs> pretty right. uh, intuitive, but, but still, sometimes people need to be reminded. Yeah, so, the, so you want to skip the burger and fries late at night, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the pizza and the tacos um, because they're spicy. Um, you don't really want to go too heavily with protein-rich foods. It should be in balance um, always with carbs. So um, the one population that I do want to have protein at night is the pregnant woman mm -hmm. um, because it, um, for pregnant women it helps with the nausea and it keeps their blood sugar level during the night to have a protein-rich snack before they go to bed. But it is harder to digest. Um, and then liquids after 8 p.m., this is simply the idea that you don't want to be drinking a lot of liquids which would cause you to wake and to have to use the toilet during the night. Mm, so it's not that they keep you up, but they fill your bladder. Right. Well, and the type, you know, mm -hmm. um, the okay. type is important. So. Yeah, and here I have maybe when you're talking about type, um, you were talking specifically about caffeine, which is a stimulant I think is pretty obvious to people, but you also mention uh, decaf coffee. Don't drink that. Right, because there's still some caffeine in decaf coffee. Mm -hmm. We don't eliminate it entirely. Um, but then there are those hidden sources of caffeine like chocolate and cola. Um, and then particularly in terms of fertility, um, they're looking at caffeine's effect on sperm production. 800 milligrams of caffeine a day. They recently, there were two studies that came out about the suppression of sperm production um, with too much caffeine intake in the guys. Um, and then smoking, uh, the uh, cigarettes are actually a stimulant with effects similar to caffeine. Uh, okay, I can't say anything good about smoking anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it, has, it has other side effects that are uh, not yeah, desirable. Yeah, pretty, but you had alcohol on here. I mean, a lot of people feel sticky after they've had a, a drink. Um, right. It's kind of a catch-22 with alcohol. You can fall asleep faster with alcohol, but you can experience more frequent awakenings. Your sleep is less restful. You can have headaches because of the dehydration that's associated with alcohol. You can have night sweats or nightmares associated. And so balancing each drink um, that you have with a glass of water helps to dilute the effect of alcohol, particularly on making you dehydrated. And so um, it's not that you can't have alcohol. It's just the whole thing is about the moderation. And then marijuana. Um, which Not I don't have listed so here, but I did uh, put in the, in the picture. You, got the, you have the picture of it, so I'm going to say marijuana disrupts ovulation. Uh, that's pretty, pretty well known. And then um, in men, it encourages the formation of abnormal sperm. It decreases testosterone production, and it inhibits the ability of the sperm to fertilize an egg. Well, that's so, pretty serious for fertility. Yeah. And so um, with the legalization of marijuana in certain places, I just wonder, um, we need to get the message out that if you're, uh, for your fertility health, you need to consider what your habits are with that. Right. So um, that was quite a bit of information. What I'd like to do at this point is just check to see if we have any questions. We are bumping up on the 40 minutes, so we have just a few minutes uh, to answer questions. So bear with me one moment while I take a look. Um, one of the questions that we have um, is, can you talk about the relationship of sleep to fertility? So this was probably one that um, uh, was entered earlier in the talk. 
so it's perhaps that we're recommending certain kinds of sleep or certain amounts of sleep to uh, well we're them. recommending no light at night because it suppresses your melatonin mm -hmm. which is in, intimately involved in ovulation and so that is the relationship and then having healthy sleep um, is important in terms of melatonin being able to do what it needs to do mm -hmm. um, with sleep and menstrual cycle and what have you. Was there anything else you wanted to add about melatonin? I know that uh, you had quite a bit of information that we didn't talk about specifically here just for time purposes, but um, was there anything in relation to um, perhaps... Well, melatonin um, has been understood to be associated with um, anovulation if you have, so not ovulating or mm -hmm. um, irregularly cycling because you'll see altered um, suppressed melatonin in women with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm -hmm. women that don't ovulate. And one of the things with the uh, birth control pill is that there was a decreased amount of melatonin with birth control pills and and it depends on the age of the study and the dose of the birth control pill but you saw um, birth control pills are associated with suppressing ovulation so it makes sense that it would suppress melatonin as well. Oh that's interesting so and what about the recent pills and the other hormonal methods that perhaps mm -hmm. have a lower dose? Um, and that's, that is information that I don't have because um, these studies were done when um, the pill doses were a little bit higher in the 90s. Mm. Although we did have 20 microgram, the low dose pills back then, they tended to have a little higher dose. Um, and so the lower the dose that a birth control pill has, um, the less likely it's going to be suppressing ovulation. Like when it came out on the market in 1959, it had 180 micrograms okay, nice. of estrogen. Yeah, so women were not ovulating, but on a pill today they are. So, um, so there is some effect on melatonin, but I couldn't tell you um, how that. It just supported earlier thoughts that deep, decreased melatonin would be associated with anovulation. Mm -hmm. Well, that has all been very interesting, and we've come to the end of our uh, questions. So I would like to thank you, Dr. Barron, for this very interesting discussion. And I'd also like to thank our audience for attending. Uh, if you would like to contact us, here are our phone number and email address. And especially uh, if you'd like to be added to our announcements list for future Edu Series events, you can view this, or you will be able to view this recording and other webinars on the Cycle Technologies YouTube channel. So please look there and we will continue to add new ones. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We do make announcements there so you can keep up on the latest. So this is Ann Mullen again from Cycle Technologies uh, saying have a healthy sleep and goodbye. Goodbye Dr. Barron. Thank you so much. Thank you Ann.